Well, happy Sunday, everybody. We're here again, New Hope Community Online Church, and we want to welcome you into this space today. We've got some great specials for you today, musical numbers, and we have uh, prayer time today as well. Plus, we're continuing our Overwhelmed series. And so join us, please share us, comment, and we would love to engage with you today. And this is a wonderful opportunity to uh, click like, share this to your timeline, and make sure people tune in because we know that God is going to use this video today. So welcome into this space. Let's pray as we get started. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day that we can come into this space. And we pray, Father, that though we can't be in our church building today, we know, Father, that you are uh, alive and active outside the walls of our church any Sunday morning. So, God, we pray today that you are at work in our space today, in our living room, wherever we're watching this. And, Father, we do pray that this video would reach those who need to be reached today. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Meet Bob. Bob's been coming to church for a while now. Amidst the busyness of work and life, he wants to grow closer to the Lord, but he feels like something's missing. He reads his Bible, well, sometimes. He's attending a home group and even listening to podcasts of old sermons. But try as he might, he just feels like something's missing. Then Bob heard a teaching on giving financially. He felt a little convicted, knowing that he and his family were not regularly tithing 10%. But he wondered, does God really command me to give the first 10% to the church? Does the church really even need the money? Oh, what's in it for me? Why should I give? Bob decided to dig a little deeper and look into it for himself. So he opened his Bible and really didn't know where to look. So he Googled Bible passages about money. He was very surprised to find a large number of verses about tithing and not just in the Old Testament. Jesus himself taught about tithing to the local church. Now Bob was really feeling convicted. He was beginning to see why the tithe was so important. It wasn't about the church needing money or trying to scam him in some way. It was a question of the heart. Bob repented of his disobedience and he started to return the first 10% of his income to God. He was pleasantly surprised to see breakthroughs in many areas of his life. His relationship with his children, his marriage, and even his finances began to improve. Bob thought back to one of the verses that he'd read about the time. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out my blessing upon you. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this service thus far. We're just going to take just a few moments and just mention a few things. One is that most things that we're doing right now, we are doing on Zoom, we're doing online, all meetings and such, and there are things that are continuing to happen uh, as we speak. And so we are preparing uh, for Yellow to come back, and as soon as we are back at Yellow, we're going to be back to church live and in person, and we're excited about that. Can't wait until we get ramped up and do things again. Now, in the meantime, uh, we thank you for your patience. We thank you for bearing with us. And let's all continue to do what we need to do to make sure that we're all safe and we protect each other as well. So, uh, also, we want to bring this to your attention as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your faithful giving. We know that you have made the effort to make sure that your tithe and offerings are getting in. You can uh, click, click the link down below, uh, email us an e-transfer. You can also drop it off here at the church in person, uh, or you can contact our treasurer, Shanna Dryden. So again, we want to thank you for your faithful giving. Let's continue to get back to worship.
and welcome to prayer time at New Hope. This morning is day number 17 in our month of fasting and prayer here in, in January. The Bible says that if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. Let's draw near to him this morning as we pray. Will you pray with me? Father, we <clears throat> thank you for your word. We thank you where the, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the word. And so we come and worship him today. We pray, Father, that on this day 17 of our prayer and fasting month, we pray that your word would encourage us to follow you in all areas of our life. Father, we thank you that we can come to you today and with our deep concern and concentrated prayer for, for a number of folks that we have been praying for very earnestly all week. We pray for Patrick and for his parents, John and Martin. Thank you, Lord, for the good report that we've gotten and we pray that you would continue to heal this little boy that as he goes home to be with his parents that father you would give them great wisdom and perseverance and patience as they train up this young man father we pray for pastor david gray and irma their family <clears throat> as they trust you every day and for Rhonda, Father, we thank you for, for Rhonda Vautour. We thank you for the way in which her hip replacement has been successful. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to heal her. We pray, Lord, for the lonely. Some in our own church. Some in the community. Father, that, and some even maybe lonely in the midst of a crowd. And Father, I pray that you would stand with these people. Remind them that the Bible says that you hold us in the palm of your hand. And Father, may they experience that close fellowship with you today. Lord, we thank you for Premier Higgs and the COVID committee and Dr. Russell. And I pray that you might cause us to obey them, <clears throat> not them, but the guidelines that are so important for us to, to know and to follow in these days as we together fight, <clears throat> fight COVID. And cause us to follow these guidelines that our leaders have set forth. And in the course of the days, to cause us to trust you as Lord with the outcome of what's going to happen. Father, probably the most important word for us to think about beyond obedience in this month is the word adjust. And so, Father, may we adjust to whatever needs to happen so that we can be safe from COVID. Father, I pray too for Pastor Brock and for Rhonda, for the leadership team, for our worship team, for Miriam, the director of We College, and Lord, for others who are in leadership here in our church. Father, as we make this place a safe place for everyone in our community, Lord, I pray that you might give us the guidance that we need and to adapt to whatever we need to adapt so that we will be useful vessels in your hands. Because we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, interesting it's amazing thank you Donnie for that duet I always knew that you uh, spoke to yourself and talked to yourself now you're singing to yourself two Donnies I'm not sure <laughs> if we can handle two Donnies anyway thank you Donnie that was absolutely amazing and thank you Jason for figuring all that technical stuff out all right so we are taking a look at number three of our overwhelmed sermon series and so uh, let's let's dig in here there's not too many games that I'm real good at, board games and such. Uh, Jenga, you know that game? I, I'm, I'm okay with that game. That, that's a little more my speed. The game of Monopoly, I, I, I can go bankrupt. The game of chess, well, a monkey could beat me. The game of Twister, uh, I'm not flexible enough for that. The game of life, the board game and life itself, haven't quite figured that one out either. But Jenga is just my speed. It's a simple game. You know what I mean. 
you, you have the blocks all stacked up and then you take a block from the bottom and you have to put it on top and uh, uh, the whole game is based on your, your skill and agility and, and uh, steady hand to make sure that you get the right block out and put it on top without, of course, upsetting the whole thing. The game is quite simple. If they knock it over, putting a block on the top or taking a block out, they lose and you win. Okay, and so that's the game there. And as the game progresses, this game of Jenga, you want to make sure that you've got a steady base and you're taking blocks out so not to knock that base and make the base unsteady. The game, though, gets interesting when the, when the base, when the foundation of the blocks gets a little vicarious there and you, you are, are, are on pins and needles trying to get a block out and putting it on the top. And then, if you're like me, you get this deviant pleasure out of watching someone with an even more vicarious base trying to get their block. And you get pleasure out of the fact that they're not going to do it this time. They're going to knock over the blocks over and you're going to win. Now, I would argue, though, that Jenga has some lessons for us in this life. Your base, your foundation, your cornerstone that you are building upon is key to your success and your life's security. Now, life sometimes takes a block from the bottom, tries to put it on top, and it can make us feel a little uneasy, a little unsteady when life throws us certain things. And maybe your life from time to time, or maybe your life right now, is a little bit wobbly as you're trying to put the pieces of your life in and out of your life there. The idea of building your life on a firm, unshakable foundation is nothing new to the game of Jenga or even the Bible. In fact, it wasn't Jenga's idea that you have a firm foundation. It was Jesus' idea. You need to build your life on the rock. You need a firm foundation. You need a cornerstone. And if you do that, if you build your life on the cornerstone, if you build your life on a firm foundation, which is Jesus, you are wise. Well, let's take a look at a piece of scripture here. I'll put it on the screen for you. I'm also putting an outline down below in the comments. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27 says... Jesus said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose. The winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, we've all been there, right? We've all been there. We've, we've built uh, something, and, and the storms of life come, and it washes it away. And it's just an absolutely crushing feeling to realize, you know what? I had a false hope in this, that this would be secure. I had a false hope that, that, that this was really going to work out. And we're left in pieces. In fact, if life were the game of Jenga, we would look like this. All right. Well, I wouldn't want to be this kid. Ouch. Well, this month, we've been working our way through 10 promises of God for those of us who feel anxious, for those of us that feel overwhelmed, for those of us that the circumstances of life has taken a few blocks out of our foundation here, we're feeling a little bit wobbly, and that can cause us to feel anxious. And we've all been there. We've all felt anxious. We've all felt fearful. We've all felt like life is starting to collapse all around us or closing in around us or falling out from beneath us and during these seasons of trials and troubles, the foundation of our life is tested and we become anxious and we realize that maybe we've built our life on not firm, but flimsy and false foundations. Now, many of you have probably watched yourself or a child or a grandchild or a family member, and they've kind of uh, 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 mocked that firm foundation. They, they don't accept that firm foundation, 
and they've built their own foundation to their life, and they've built it uh, on vicarious things, and, and whether it be finances or a job that's not quite secure, and that they put everything into their life, yet they don't have that firm foundation of Jesus Christ. And we watch them go through life and thinking, I don't know if they're going to make it. I think things are going to collapse. And they may be like this video. Now you see that these guys, they don't have a very firm foundation at all. And, but they're going to go for it. They're going to try it. And sometimes in life, we're the same way. We think, how can they do this? Or I'm going to make this move here. I'm not sure how it's going to hang on here. I'm not sure if it's going to work out. And then it does. Like, wow. And that's the deal with some people. They don't have a firm foundation, yet they go through life with a vicarious f building here. They're not quite sure if it's going to work out, but they're hoping it's going to work out. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But when it doesn't, people are left with tatters. They're left with stress and anxiety and all these things because things didn't work out and they can find themselves in despair because they thought their foundation would hold, but it didn't. Well, there comes a time in everybody's life that without a firm foundation, things do collapse. It's that lack of foundation, that lack of a center, that lack of guiding principles that can cause anxiety. And it's no wonder, right? I can't imagine how the world without Jesus Christ would not have anxiety. Imagine thinking there was no God, or God is indifferent, and, or is uh, thinking that everything is just random, it's just a random existence, and I, I am just here by chance. And Instead of having God at the center, you are at the center. And whatever you make life for yourself and whatever foundation that you have and whatever that you have built is all dependent upon you and the people around you. No wonder this world is so overwhelming for some. No wonder people are searching for meaning. No wonder people self-medicate. No wonder people get lost in addiction. No wonder people have unhealthy bonds or relationships. No wonder people are constantly searching for meaning and security. Why? Because we need it. We crave it. We crave that firm foundation that is unshakable. And when life does go wrong, people are left scurrying and trying to find something to anchor to. And that's why it's so important that we build this church on the proper foundation of Christ-centered principles and that we live in a way that is honoring to Christ and that when people in our area and people in our surrounding area and our circle of influence need a rock and a foundation, they know that they can walk into a church that will give them Christ-centered principles and they can anchor to that cross, that, that rock, and they can grow in this environment and we need to be that for other people, showing that Jesus Christ is the rock. We have the answer. We have the one foundation in this entire universe that will never change, that will never shift, that won't blow away, that won't sink in the sand, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus gives us that rock, that foundation. As I stated last week, we are not equipped as human beings to deal with all that this life throws at us. We're not meant to have lived in a world full of so much uh, chaos and so much imperfection and so much trouble. We are just not capable of doing it. And that's why Christ offers us his hand and says, I can give that to you. I can give you that foundation. I will give you that peace that you cannot get yourself. So with that, let's take a look at the two promises that we're dealing with this week. Again, we're taking a look at 10 promises in five weeks. And so we're going to be taking a look at uh, uh, number five and six today. So the first promise we're going to deal with today is this. Jesus promises a firm foundation. Pretty simple point, right? We've already talked about this. We've set it up. But Jesus promised you and Jesus promises me a firm foundation. Psalm 61, 2 says this, When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. 
I could not prepare this sermon without every time I came back to that phrase, a firm foundation. Jesus promises a firm foundation without that old hymn, how firm a foundation echoing through my mind. I didn't have all the lyrics straight, so I wrote them down. Here's the, here they are on the screen. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who refuge for Jesus have fled? In other words, how peaceful it is that we have a foundation in Jesus Christ. I've shared with you before that I have had issues with, with my anchor and on, on my sailboat. I, I don't trust it. I don't trust it at all. More times than I'd like to, to, to care, think about, my boat has drifted away from its mooring or its anchor. I get a call that, hey, the wind's blowing and I think I see your boat going into the bay and I've had to go chase that boat. I don't trust the mooring. And I don't trust my anchor. In fact, one time I was preparing my sermon in the, at the table in the boat and I could hear the waves lapping up on the shore and I had anchored way out and I thought, oh, I'm in trouble, came out and I was just about to be beached. I don't trust my anchor. It's not a good feeling at all. In fact, I would go to bed at night in my home and think about, okay, which way is the wind blowing and is, is my anchor going to hold? It's a terrible feeling. Do you see some parallels here? I can't imagine going through life with all that life throws at us and not having a firm foundation and having that anxiety, that overwhelming feeling that am I going to be okay or is this going to sink my ship or I'm going to be set adrift and I don't have an anchor. Well, a few years ago, we didn't do it in the past few summers, but a few years ago, we, we started taking our sailboat down to Beulah Camp on the St. John River. And on the St. John River, uh, up and down the up and down the river, they have these old ferry boat uh, wharfs, and these are uh, cement, well built wharfs that have been there for over a hundred years. El Beulah Camp has one of those wharfs that it now owns, and we went and we docked the sailboat down there and tied it to the wharf there. And here's a picture of that there. And you can see it's a fair sized sailboat that we we had. And it, it, it's, it's dwarfed, though, by this wharf. The boat is not very heavy. It's a sailboat with water ballast, and it's not that heavy without the water in the ballast. And so it's only about 1,000 pounds. But I had absolute security that when I tied to that wharf, we were not going anywhere. I knew that when I went to sleep at night, I would wake up and we would be in the same spot in the morning, directly tied to that wharf. That wharf was not going anywhere. And as long as we were tied to that wharf, we weren't going anywhere as well. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Well, there's another song that I absolutely love. And I love this song because it speaks to me. I can relate to it. I can relate to it in life. And I can relate to it in the boating world as well. And it's the beautiful song called The Anchor Holds. I'll put the words on the screen as well. The anchor holds, though the ship is battered. The anchor holds, though the sails are torn. I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas. The anchor holds in spite of the storm. We humans anchor our lives to some pretty good, but not all that solid and secure things in our life. And we need to have that verse in mind. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. We in this world can anchor our things to a lot of things that are, that are good. A relationship, a job, and finances, a hobby, all those different things. But uh, none of those things are as high as the rock that is Jesus Christ. None of those is firm like Jesus Christ. None of them uh, uh, has that stay power there. Not a relationship, not a job, not a bank account, not a feeling or an emotion, not a hobby, not our health, not a child or a grandchild. Every single one of those rocks that we anchor to is temporary. But Jesus Christ is permanent. All those things are fickle, temporal, dependent on how those things treat me or how they make me feel secure. It's anchoring to our boat, anchoring our boat to the shifting sand. The offer of Jesus Christ is a rock-solid anchor for your life, your emotions, your anxiety. Lead me to the rock that is higher 
than I. Often we use uh, these other things in this world as our anchor. Simon and Garfunkel wrote a song about 50, maybe almost 60 years ago now, and one of the, the lines in that is, I am a rock. Well, no, you're not. You're, you're not a rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The sand shifts, it ebbs, it flows. The circumstances of life, I myself am not a rock. I am shifting sand as well. And I suffer the anxieties as a result because things are always changing and I am not in control. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And that leads us to our second promise today. The second promise we're dealing with today is he, Jesus, promises victory over our struggles. Jesus promises victory over our struggles. John chapter 16, verse 33 says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is absolutely the most used scripture that I use in my sermons. It may be the most quoted scripture that I quote. Why? Because it sums up this world. We live in a world that, and Jesus, we live in a world of trouble, and Jesus offers help. I have told you these things, Jesus said, so that you may have peace. In this world you may have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I would love to use this point in this sermon to preach that uh, this conclusion, this one here, that you will have a victory. You will be delivered. Jesus will take all of your struggles away. But that's not what I'm preaching. I, I, I can't preach that. What I am preaching is he promises victory over those struggles. He doesn't promise that those struggles will go away. But it would be nice to say that, you know what, if you just have enough faith or if you just pray hard enough or if you just get enough people praying for you, all of your problems will go away. I cannot preach that. That is a false gospel and there are some good reasons why God doesn't swoop in and just take away all the problems from his children. Lori Hatcher, who's a contributing editor for Crosswalk.com, she came up with a few reasons. She came up with nine. I'm going to give you five here why Jesus doesn't swoop in and just absolutely give us relief from all of our struggles, take our struggles and our circumstances away. And number one, he knows that a rescue would, would not be the best for you. He knows that a rescue would not be the best for you. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 says this, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I may need to go through this. It may be best for me. In the long run, it may be best for my faith. It may be best for my attitude. It may be best for my maturity if I go through this. And the victory that I get in this struggle is the victory that I will receive when I realize that this is refining me. This is maturing me. Number two, we need to learn or a character quality we need to develop in this situation. I need to learn something here or maybe I need to, to develop some character as a result of this situation. Again, it's the refining nature of this thing. And God is not going to relieve me of these struggles. He's not going to relieve me of these circumstances because this is bringing me to a place where he needs me to be. Number three, God is building our faith story so that one day we can share what we've learned. One of the things that uh, Christian prison ministries used to say over and over and over when they came in to volunteer at the jail was, make your mess your message. And when, when guys would, would do that, and when they realize that I've got a story to share, I've got something that I can warn people about, I can show how Jesus shaped me and used me and refined me through this, your mess becomes your message. Number four, God is doing something amazing. Scripture, verse Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I has not seen nor heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. 
He may not be taking you out of these struggles. He may not take away these circumstances because he is creating something beautiful in the midst of this. Number five, God is developing his mind and heart in you. Isn't that beautiful? God is developing his mind and his heart in you. Romans 8, 28 through 29. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. I said there was five, but I got one more. Number six, God is teaching you that a close personal spiritual relationship with him is sweeter and more precious than a happy, healthy, trouble-free physical life. That may be hard to take. And I know what you may be thinking. You may be thinking, that's not what I need right now. What I need right now is for this anxiety, for this feelings of being overwhelmed. I need this troubled water to leave. I, I want relief from that. I want God to take it all away because I feel overwhelmed. Well, we're going to take an action step here today in conclusion. Here's our action step. God may not take it away, but you can give it to him. God may not take it away, but you can give it to him. So the action step here is abandon the outcomes that I'm worried about. Abandon my, what, how I, I want this to end up. Abandon my thought of how I think this should be resolved. Abandon that to God. Anxiety is often a disorder of control. Trying to control emotions. Trying to control what other people think of me. Trying to control how this situation turns out. So an essential way of dealing with anxiety is learning to abandon the outcome and give it to God. Say, God, I, I am not in control of this, nor do I want to be in control of this because it is stressing me out. So I am going to abandon my desired outcome here. I'm going to abandon my desire to end this circumstance right now to you. Well, perhaps the first place to work on how you view your anxiety, we want to our anxiety, we want to our anxiety to go away. We just want it to leave. We want God to help in removing the anxiety, remove these feelings of being overwhelmed. I, I want you, God, to control my symptoms. The problem with that kind of thinking and the problem with uh, wanting that is that it only increases anxiety when we do that. Instead of God taking away the stress and anxiety or whatever it is that's stressing it out, give that over to God and let him deal with the outcome. One of the things we may need to speak to God is, God, I'm, I'm worried about this, or I'm worried about that, or please take my stress away, or please remove me from this. Help me be calm. Instead, we may need to pray this, God, I leave the result to you. I'm not going to worry about the outcome anymore. I give it to you. I'm not there in the past, but you are. I'm not there in the future, but you are. You have a desired outcome for me. Help me to accept that. So why don't we sum up everything that I've just said here in a prayer. I'm going to put that prayer on the screen. And I would invite you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I want to trust you. I want to anchor to the rock that is you. I don't want to drift away anymore on life's seas. Lord, you are my rock, my foundation, my harbor. I also pray today that I abandon my desire to control outcomes, abandon the outcome to your perfect will and way. I pray that through my troubles, I develop a close, personal, spiritual relationship with you. Amen.
Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Angie, uh, Abby's mom. Thank you, Dar and June and Donnie and Susan uh, for participating in this service. And thank you, Gordon, as well. There is one person that has made this all come together for us. And without his expertise in, in, in tech and trying to do the impossible, and that is Jason Godfrey, who's our sound technician. He has brought this together. And I want to thank him for the hours that he's put in making this possible. Thank you, Jason. Again, thank you all for your patience and understanding during this time. And I look forward to coming out of yellow, hopefully soon, and seeing you all again in person. In the meantime, do not feel like you can't reach out to us. You can at any time. Call, email, make sure that you uh, are getting your needs met. We want to be there for you in prayer and care as well. So please let us know if, if there's anything that we can address for you. If you have prayer concerns, let us know. We'd love to pray for uh, you. Thank you to Pastor Gordon as well for his excellency when it comes to praying and caring for us as well. And so with that, let's close with a blessing. Father, we want to thank you for being here and meeting with us. Father, thank you for speaking to us today. And God, we want to thank you for all that you're doing for us. Continue to protect us and guide us as we go through this pandemic. Father, grant wisdom to Premier Higgs and Dr. Russell as they lead us and guide us through some major and big decisions. Father, we ask for your wisdom to be upon them. And Father, for us, as we go through this week, in this pandemic, may we find ways to reach out to one another, to reach those who need to be spoken to, those need to be received of encouragement this week. Help us be an instrument this week of yours. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.